hear from our speaker who's going to be giving the luncheon address. Let's give a quick background on who he is. Mr. Faris Haddad Zerbos is the World Bank Country Manager for Malaysia based in Kuala Lumpur. Mr. Haddad, a U.S. national, joined the World Bank in 1996 with the Private Sector Development Department. He served as a manager of the Technical Cooperation Program with the Gulf Cooperation countries from 2001 to 2000 until 2003, head of mission for Iraq from 2003 to 2005, operation manager for the West Bank and Gaza 2005-2008, and country manager for Bolivia from 2012 until 2015. In 2008, Mr. Haddad Zervos took a leave of absence from World Bank to serve as the deputy head of the quarter office for the Middle East Peace Process based in Jerusalem. Mr. Haddad was also a visiting lecturer on economic development in conflict states at Georgetown University, John Hopkins University, and holds a master's degree in economics from George Mason University, and a master's degree in finance from George Washington University. Without any further ado, let's put your hands together for Mr. Haddad. Every country, including Malaysia, actually grapple with these issues. Clearly, the topic of good governance, transparency, unity of vision and approach, and moderation are critical to drive and sustain a nation in its development path. I'm sure that all the great minds around this room um, will undoubtedly come to a clear vision uh, to be laid out for Malaysia and would underpin a, a productive dialogue between all important players in the Malaysian storyline. This is clearly something that involves the government, public sector, private sector, and the very ever important civil society which you represent. From our side of the bank, I was really thinking what we can contribute to this discussion here today, given our mandate and given the type of work uh, that we do and how we provide substance to this discussion. So for the stock, I'm going to focus on the area of the World Bank's work in Malaysia and other countries and talk about the drivers of sustainable growth in Malaysia in a new and changing world. My talk is going to focus on global megatrends, then on the drivers for and constraints to sustainable economic growth in the country. For those of you who are not interested in economics, I should say, you don't have to be economists, but if you're not interested in eco economics, you're going to be bored by my lecture. I hope you have a penchant for it, or at least some patience, if not a penchant for it. Um, again, as I said, I know this is a, a subset of a broader discussion here, but I hope to complement your presentations and, 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 and panels and, and all the great work that's come out here in an area that we're focusing on, not only in Malaysia, but throughout the world. I would say that over the past two and a half years I've, uh, since I've been here, I've heard from many of you, um, and I see Tatsu Ramon there getting ready, so I prepare this time, sir. <laughs> Uh, saying uh, that we should branch out and discuss other areas and to talk about broader issues, many of which go beyond our mandate as an economic development institution. These are very important issues. Um, but sometimes I have to say that us not talking about them may be misinterpreted as something political. 
or something motivated, which I can assure you uh, is not. I have to say that you know it's actually ironic uh, that we're you know that that, that view is, is 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 carried because it is precisely the additionality and frankly the value and strength of the World Bank Group Institution that we maintain singularly focused on the economics and the long-term growth tra trajectory. That singular focus on the economics and on the longer-term growth issues, and are constantly speaking up, uh, speaking to this, despite the daily, weekly, monthly, and, and yearly vagaries and issues that come up, is what has hopefully provided ultimate value for our clients and partners over the past 70 years now. The longer-term economic storyline, which is very important, and this is what I'll talk about today, is is is. Is, is really important, but acknowledging full well that this is only part of the story and should be complemented with other perspective and other sectors and other issues that you're talking about. So having said that, let me start very quickly talking about some of this issue of the global mega, mega trends that many of you uh, already know. This year has been a very good one for the region, which po posted almost 6.5% of growth. Driven by China, the region's growth uh, also saw some strong performance by countries such as Malaysia, uh, where growth was revised upwards, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. However, global growth remains sluggish, despite a pickup to 3% in 2017 from 2.3% in 2016. Some of the contributing factors include the continuing policy uncertainty in advanced economies, increases in non-tariff trade barriers, and slow global, global trade, uh, trade growth and a long-term slowdown in global productivity, which is a serious issue, down from 5% in the 70s uh, until the late 90s to 1% since uh, the mid-2000s. As you know, East Asia has experienced a similar trend since the Asia financial crisis. Labor productivity growth is declining in several ASEAN countries, including Vietnam, Malaysia, and Thailand. Even in China, which accounted for 30% of the world's growth last year, productivity growth is actually declining. Most importantly, inequality is rising. According to a study by Oxfam, the richest 62 people in the world own as much wealth as the poorest 3.6 billion people in the world. Economic growth has disproportionately benefited a few and already well-off segments of the populations. In some ASEAN countries, growing inequality has accompanied high levels of urbanization, with many people falling behind while a few reap rich gains. We're seeing, some, we're seeing some emerging megatrends that will shape the world's future prospects, including countries in the region. For example, demographic changes, which you all know. Um, rapid aging is already uh, a reality or will become so in coming decades across much of the region. A number of these countries will see a decline in the relative size of the working age labor force. For example, between 2010 and 2040, the share of the working age population will fall by more than 10% in Singapore and Thailand. A second group, such as Malaysia, Vietnam, and Indonesia, will see their demographic tailwind turn to a headwind over the coming decade or so. Other countries, Philippines, Lao, PDR, etc., they will start to see this shift shifts after 2040. So aging raises across all the spectrum economic and social challenges that will require major policy options. This will have implications not only on the level, at, uh, the level of these countries, but on migration patterns between them. Indeed, many of our countries will grow old before they grow rich. A second global megatrend, which I'm not going to talk about because I think you all know quite a bit about them and no need to convince you of this, is this issue of climate change. And I'm speaking globally, we'll get to Malaysia shortly. I don't need to convince you of the repercussions of climate change, whether we talk about natural disasters and their impacts, or about longer term issues. Countries' readiness to deal with these issues and their willingness to promote and implement green growth policies are becoming increasingly critical. The third mega trend, however, and I'd like to talk about this and harp on this a little bit, and it may seem unrelated to your discussions, but I would pause it and try to convince you that they are. Uh, uh, this third one is a doozy, as they say in the US, and it's about digital age and the digital revolution. We all know that the digital revolution is an unprecedented pace of technological change. It's not about iPhones, computers, IT's, iPads. It's about the rate of change in technology. Technology being anything from the printing press to what we have now. It's a new form of technology, but it's the pace of change that is very important. The rise of quantum computing, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, cybersecurity, 
Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, fintech, big data, the gig, the gig economy, all of these things were things that a few years ago they didn't exist in the dictionary, they didn't exist in anybody's vocabulary. Yet now there are real challenges and opportunities that confront all of us. We are seeing massive digital dividends that can be accrued to our societies if the rules of the games are right and if everyone has access, but also can create a digital divide and can create haves and have-nots among economies, sectors, and people. We are witnessing disruptive technologies altering long-established supply and logistics change, chains, increased inequalities in the workplace, and eroding traditional employer-employee relationships. In fact, these technological trends are altering our traditional understanding of economic development, whereby countries usually grew, and this is some, one of the mantras of the World Bank early on, where we felt that countries should grow and always grew and develop first by industrializing and then moving into services. But this original mantra, this common Asian development story that we all knew about is no longer the case. It may no longer be that relevant. While developing countries do experience some industrialization, with China now the world's leading manufacturing powerhouse, the majority of low-income developing countries are not seeing the level of industrialization reached by their predecessors. Actually, the onset of deindustrialization is taking place much sooner and at much lower incomes. This has worrying implications as late developing countries have been moving straight into services. But that's usually where informality is common and productivity is not much higher than the traditional sectors. This is a really actually important point um, and has implications beyond economics and frankly is a dynamic process that we should talk and I hope you will talk about across your discussions today. Technological change is not only about economics but will change the cal calculus of nations, their governance, the idea of social capital and social interactions. This will require new tools and new ways of imagining future challenges and solutions that don't really exist today. So these are some of the global uh, megatrends I wanted to talk about, but ones that should not be outside the scope of the discussions or of Malaysia's economic storyline. This is the new global environment which pervades most if not all countries, not least of which is an, uh, an open economy like Malaysia. So let me turn to Malaysia very quickly, and I'm conscious of the time, but I think we're, I think we're okay now, we're okay. Turning to Malaysia's economic storyline, as you know, we, the World Bank, recently revised the GDP figures for Malaysia, uh, noting a GDP growth of 5.8% in 2017, and strong growth moving forward in the next couple of years. This growth is driven by domestic demand and underpinned by solid macroeconomic policy. Private sector spending has remained strong, and the cyclical recovery in the world economy and global trade has really uh, helped Malaysia in that regard. And we retain this view. We are very sanguine and we are very positive on this. And this is matched by data. But we have also and continue to stress the idea of keeping our eye on the prize. And I've done a lot of interviews and I keep saying this in that term, keeping our eye on the prize. By that, we mean that now the time is ripe for deepening structural reforms. The current growth is positive, yes, in Malaysia. And the country has performed well in its economic indicators. This is in a period, as I mentioned early, earlier, of greater global uncertainty and with new megatrends. As such, now is the time to accelerate key reforms needed to propel Malaysia into high income country status. And a status that cannot and should not be measured by a singular and one dimensional GNI, GNI per capita figure, but by a broad area and a broad set of institutional and economic characteristics. As I mentioned earlier, uh, global growth is on the uptick. Uh, since mid-2016, uh, driven by cyclical upturns, etc., manufacturing. And it's est estimated to continue to be this in the next few years. The upturn has been broad-based, and growth has been, you know, led by most uh, advanced economies, but emerging economies have been doing well. Um, uh, but after all, it, uh, uh, so, uh, jump back. So, basically, we would say that this is a good time to take a short breath, to congratulate ourselves for the work, great work done, but also start focusing on the next steps and what are the key reforms needed to sustain us in the leaner years that may and will likely come ahead sometime in the future, because this is are we live in cycles. After all, the risks to the global outlook remain. Disorderly financial market movements, possible abrupt tightening in global financial conditions, a sudden rise in volatility could trigger turbulence in the financial markets and could potentially derail the global expansion. Uh, weaker than anticipated rebounds in the advanced economies 
sharp movements in commodity prices could also have an impact. And we also cannot ignore the geopolitical risks that historically have been confined to certain regions that now seem to be spreading and new risks coming up. So there's always, you know, uh, we're in a good positive trend in the cycle, but the global risks uh, remain. So stepping outside the, the, the frame of these short-term perspectives, we see that despite a recent acceleration in this global economic activity, potential output growth, and this is an economic term, potential output, is actually flagging, which is a serious concern. At 2.5%, potential growth over the past five years was less than one percentage point, point uh, below its average a decade ago, with an even steeper decline in emerging economies. Over the long term, a more, pretense, uh, a more pronounced output growth uh, in both advanced economies and emerging markets would make the global economy more vulnerable to shocks and worsen the, the prospects. So this is on one side. On the other side, as I mentioned, the global economy is navigating through some really, really big changes in structural trends. And again, coming back, this is why I said I was harping on it, coming back to this issue of rapid technological advances, emergence of new growth areas and industries, changing demographics and labor markets. These underlying global forces are redefining the playing field for the region and will only get more intense moving forward. Again, I'm harping on this, but this is very important. And I'll give you two examples to really say, you know, stress why I'm saying this. You've all heard of this idea of the Internet of Things, of course, and obviously advanced robotics. So why is this relevant for a discussion like this? The point I'm trying to make is that the challenges, the issues we're trying to tackle, will probably, in a few years from now, exist in a completely different world, where the whole level, or the whole game is going to change, and the whole sort of map is going to change. Internet of Things and robotics. These things are very likely to challenge our country's established patterns of comparative advantage. If it becomes more efficient, and we're seeing this, it's becoming more efficient for industries to rebundle activities in smart factories using robots. One of the key shifts is that this may change and reduce our traditional views on the importance of wage competitiveness, uh, uh, increased automation on the Industry 4.0, and it will make it, make it feasible for some leading firms to reshore, reshore or onshore labor-intensive activities back to high-income economies and closer to final consumers. At the same time, evidence suggests that Chinese manufacturers are increasingly turning to automation to deal with labor market pressures, with the country projected to have the largest number of installed industrial robots by the end of this year. So these ideas of the industrial revolution, how we're going to industrialize, the whole game is changing. This is not changing winds, the whole game is changing where the traditional models, the basic models we use to assess these are changing. Before we said, well, competitiveness, low wages, but now low wages is becoming less, less of an issue in the advent of robots and things of that sort. The other issue, which you know, we think is a really cool item, you know, and that's the idea of 3D printing. 3D printing beyond actually being very useful, and it is very useful, is actually making the traditional idea of economies of scale matter less and less with other new manufacturing process technologies. Because now what we're seeing is the emergence of these micro-manufacturing with the whole economics, certainly when I went to school, in grad school, studying the importance of achieving economics of scale, they may not, not no longer be necessary because we're seeing that 3D printing is altering the whole basic definition of the need for economies of scale. So that may mean that economies of scale may not be needed in the future to achieve economic efficiency. So this is a constitutional change in the way we're doing things. So I'm bringing these stories up for a reason. And what I'm trying to say is that the combination of a weakening and potential outward growth and the shifting global megatrends makes our traditional discussions on short-term cyclical policy discourses less of a priority and underscores the need for policymakers to set their focus beyond near-term considerations towards structural reforms to boost long-term growth prospects and living standards. Like the other open trading economies in the region, Malaysia experienced a significant acceleration of growth in 2017. Sustaining this growth in this new world will require new tools and a continued focus on the setting in place the proper playing field in order to usher in a new economic gain and set of players in the markets that we haven't even identified yet. And new value-added methods and chains that are still young or have maybe don't even exist yet. Equally, uh, 
but, and if not more importantly, when it comes to taking an objective view towards Malaysia's economy, it is important to look beyond the averages. For example, while it is clear that the economy is expanding at a rapid pace, not everybody in Malaysia is experiencing the same rate of growth, with export-oriented sectors seeing much stronger output growth and in turn stronger wage growth than other segments of the economy. Similarly, while average inflation is low and stable, relatively, the cumulative price buildup of food and housing costs has had a disproportionate impact on the poorest in society, who spend the largest share of their income on the basics. The bottom 10% of Malaysia spend about 70% of their income on food and housing, and so have experienced above average inflation. Likewise, just because the average income in Malaysia is soon expected to pass the high income country threshold, does not mean that all Malaysians are becoming high income. In fact, since the median income is below the mean income, and using nerdy statistics uh, jargon, when Malaysia does nominally become a high income economy, more than half of Malaysians may not be high income. So in view of these, there are four areas of policy reforms or efforts needed in Malaysia to ensure medium-term growth sustainability and to achieve convergence with high income country status. Um, in more dimensions than just income. The authorities are of course aware of this and this is embedded in several of the current plans and reforms that are underway. But it was it seemed important for me to raise them. I think in the interest of time I won't go into too much detail, but I'll forgive me, I'll I'll, I'll cover. First is the need for productivity enhancing reforms to enhance longer term growth potential by addressing the labor market constraints and distortions in output markets building innovation capacity and unblocking the potential of the digital economy in Malaysia. Secondly, fiscal reforms to support Malaysia's effort to maintain a sustainable debt path through enhancing revenue collection and improving public sector efficiency. A third priority is concurrent efforts to promote inclusivity of growth and equal access of opportunities for all citizens by alleviating skills gaps and deficits in the labor market and improving efficiency of social assistance programs. And fourth, enhancing public sector productivity and service delivery with a greater focus on stronger presence of easily accessible data. Um, in the interest of time, I don't want to go through all of these. I think you know we've done a lot of analysis on the topic of, uh, of productivity, but I think you know one of the things when we look at when we're talking about Malaysia's productivity story, this is a country that has had factor accumulation quite well over the years that actually has been by high income and OECD standards in terms of capital and human resources. However, the productivity gains and growth rates have been less actually than other comparative countries if you want, if you want to look at it, for instance, Singapore and Korea over the past uh, few decades. And um, so a large body of work conducted by, by us shows that policies that can serve to accelerate productivity growth in Malaysia include this very important issue of overcoming skills gaps in the labor market. Uh, I think this is a very important thing. Maintaining high quality of infrastructure to support internal global trade, I think, and innovation. Innovation is going to be very critical. And unlocking the one key priority is to unlock opportunities for the digital economy as a new um, uh, driver growth. But ultimately, you know, this issue of productivity, we can speak about it and give a lot of economic jargon and Etc. It's about how resources are used in the most efficient way to yield the maximum amount of outputs. And uh, a key step in the efficient allocation of resources, and this is economics 101, is competition. And the ease with which new firms can enter the market and inefficient ones can exit. To overcome inefficiencies in output markets, Malaysia can explore ways to strengthen its competition policy and adopt competitive neutrality and regulatory stance, particularly with respect to GLC operations. From the regulatory uh, perspective, easing existing policies to further open markets for further foreign private sector participation, mainly in the service sector, would also help boost productivity. Uh, accelerating fiscal reform is also a very important issue, and, uh, and we have made a lot of recommendations in terms of taxation. Malaysia is actually is one of really the lowest income tax uh, coverage areas, you know, with currently two million income taxpayer out, out of 15 million of the nation's total workforce, which is much lower in, in other countries, but you also have a very high corporate tax rate, and there's also recommendations on GSD. Uh, we don't go into, uh, I wouldn't want to go into that in the interest of time. And of course, this issue of inclusivity continues to be very, very important. 
Um, I think it's, I'll, I'll spend the last, the last part of my time focusing on this, I have a few minutes left, and say, well, you know, globally, while there's been a substantial narrowing, and actually there is good news, not everything is, you know, negative, there is good news and it really behooves us to, to, to bring it out, and there has been a substantial narrowing globally in overall inequality, spurred by unprecedented growth in populous countries such as China and India. Um, however, sadly, within country inequality is greater now than it was 25 years ago. Uh, in fact, there's this global within country Gini index, which actually is now 39. In two, well, 2013, it was uh, 34 in 1988. In many countries in which information is on top, you know, we have information on the top 1% of the income distribution, for instance, the United States, Korea, China, and India, we see that the share of the top 1% of the total income has been increasing, and the wealthiest 1% of the world's population now owns more than half of the world's wealth. While Malaysia has achieved good progress in sustaining economic growth and reducing poverty over the past years, there remain concerns regarding the distribution of economic gains and perceived inequality of opportunity. Um, in order to improve the well-being of the B40, attention will need to be paid on both incomes and the cost of living. First and foremost, there is a critical need to facilitate higher income by addressing the skills deficit. We're not talking about high income through handouts. Productivity and skills, that should be the way that incomes are raised. Continued efforts towards income growth among the B40 continue to be constrained by what they have. And sadly, it's a skills deficit with many workers not qualified to take up better and more gainful employment. There's a pressing need to expand training, including through measures to improve skills in less job-specific areas such as problem solving, English, language, critical thinking, non-cognitive and soft skills, etc. The introduction of employment insurance, if adequately funded, has also the potential to improve the functioning of labor markets. There's also room to strengthen social nets, uh, social safety nets to vulnerable groups. I think there's no doubt that social safety nets, the, the argue that do we need social safety nets, I think is an antiquated discussion. I think that is an established fact. I mean, just one case that came up as I was writing this was looking at the Philippines P4, 4P program, which uh, um, looking at some of the numbers they had, uh, yeah, so the P, uh, 4P program has led to reductions in poverty in, in the Philippines of 1.4% percentage points every year. So 1.5 million people have exited poverty before this. So the issue of the brim and the importance of the brim to me is a foregone conclusion. But there is room for improvement. For instance, the brim does not make a distinction between urban and rural households. But this is a, a very important because the, in terms of either income eligibility thresholds or benefit levels, Notwithstanding the fact that the effects of the recent buildup of inflationary pressures has been more pronounced in urban areas as food and price inflation has been higher. Actually, it's more of a 31% cumulative increase for people in brim beneficiaries in urban areas, but only 24% of all. Yet the brim is one in the same role. And the fourth, point is, uh, the fourth priority is the path towards greater public sector productivity and effectiveness, which is a critical development outcome in all countries, but especially so in knowledge-intensive economies such as Malaysia. I think I'll just speak one more minute, Latif, if you allow me then. I think increasing public sector productivity is, is, is extremely important and the issue of open data. Enhancing service delivery with citizens at the center can be complemented by a more thorough process in terms of open data uh, inter, uh, uh, for, for a number of reasons. This includes facilitating open data among agencies across cross-agency uh, cross data sharing and leveraging big data analytics. For that, I have to say there is some good news in the sense that the World Bank in partnership with Mampu, we recently completed, and, and Malaysia did ask us to do this for them, to look at uh, an open data readiness assessment. So we've looked at, we've presented that. That is public, and we're actually working with the authorities to try to tackle a lot of these issues. So I think this is very important, this issue of the data ecosystem. It's not about, it's more about, it's more than the just data you're there. It's more, uh, it's about a, a data ecosystem where the public sector authorities, private sector institutions, and civil society all have a responsibility to issue timely, accessible, and quality data and to allow its movement to the places most needed and most intended. And to provide clear information on results, outcomes, needs, and trends. I know I'm simplifying the issue, but only because it's more complex than I can or anybody in this room can possibly 
articulate or understand. It is the new commodity, as they say, which is essential in all aspects of life. It can be harnessed under the proper regulatory institutional environment with unmeasurable impacts, and no pun intended there, on Malaysia's growth. So friends, I've spoken my piece. Let me just think, uh, conclude and recap, because I know you want to go to the rest of it, uh, the sessions. Malaysia's economy is clearly performing well in terms of growth, fiscal performance, and macroeconomic management. management. However, it is important to focus not just on the quantity of growth, but also on the quality and the extent to which it is shared. And the period of stable growth before us offers an opportunity for policymakers to refocus efforts on unblocking structural constraints to sustainable and inclusive growth in the future. Moving forward, emerging and trans uh, transformative global trends such as technology, technological disruptions do pose challenges to the world and Malaysia's medium-term growth prospects and call for broader, more forward-looking policies and reforms that transcend the uh, domestic near-term consideration to keep pace with global trends. And I think well, this is where groups such as the G25 have to really lead the thinking to get us. You know, I can tell you in the 1990s, there were wonderful discussions. I actually just out of intellectual interest looked at some of the discussions that they used. I'm not claiming that this is one of them. Please don't, don't misunderstand this. As I'm saying you have an opportunity to be, and you are different. You know, when you look at the Xerox and, uh, and the Polaroid uh, discussions and retreats, they were talking about you know, how important it is to do this, to, to do this, how to sell their products, how to change the products, the governance, right? while the whole world around them was changing, and they didn't really focus on the change and the advent of the digital economy. So just, we always, also from the World Bank perspective, this is a point that I made, that we should make sure that we don't never end up being a Polaroid convention or a Xerox convention, because I think that's a very important one. Um, reaping the full benefits of the future economy requires overcoming some of the deeper development issues that Malaysia faces, such as how to build effective education and training programs to nurture a future-ready workforce, how to create a globally competitive environment for firms to thrive, and how to drive the government public service delivery model to continue to respond to citizens' needs. Of equal importance is the need to ensure that inclusivity of growth and dividends are widely shared. A strengthening economy offers a cru critical opportunity for Malaysia to accelerate such reforms to achieve these, and we hope that this will be taken uh, advantage. Uh, this will be taken advantage of. None of this I know is new to you, uh, nor the authorities who have actually sought our advice on many of these key areas. Uh, the storyline is one that I believe we all share, and you know we look forward to working with all of you on this. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Another round of applause for Mr. Faris Al-Pisa.